turbine locomotives. What the heck is a steam turbine locomotive? Some of them look pretty funky. Well, it is a steam engine, but it's not a conventional steam engine at all. It utilizes a steam turbine. Steam turbines are, well, turbines, and they utilize steam to do mechanical work. They are highly efficient in certain contexts. Marine propulsion in particular was revolutionized by them. Many ships throughout the 1900s were powered by steam turbines, and power stations even now utilize steam turbines, particularly nuclear ones. So naturally, given the tremendous benefits steam turbines offer, why didn't we see them more with locomotives? I mean, locomotives are big and heavy like ships are. I mean, not quite that big and heavy, but still big and heavy. Surely you could get a turbine to fit and make one work on a locomotive, and... Okay, you can, but usually it doesn't go super well. Numerous attempts in many different countries were made in order to get some kind of setup to work with a locomotive and a steam turbine, and very few of them did. <laughs> And the reason has to do with the disadvantages associated with using turbines like this. But before I get to them, I will talk about their advantages. Because one of the reasons they were trying to do it at all is that they did offer significant advantages in many categories. They had extremely high efficiency at high speed. More on that later. They were also tactically a lot simpler than conventional steam locomotives. In that they had fewer moving components meaning that there was less of a likelihood of something breaking and making it inoperative. They offered more consistent torque, whereas conventional piston steam locomotives had varying torque, meaning that wheel slip was a bit more likely to occur on them. And because of the way traditional steam locomotives work, there's something called hammer blow. The configuration of side rods in the valve gear of conventional steam locomotives during their rotation around pushing the train forward, also creates horizontal forces. That's called hammer blow, and it costs a lot of extra wear and tear on the rails because it's forcing the weight down. But steam turbines usually didn't propel themselves forward in that manner. And some of them did have side rods, but not for the same reasons as regular steam locomotives would, meaning that the hammer blow on them was basically non-existent. So that's all great, wonderful. But they had a lot of problems. Uh, for one thing, getting to the work at all was often a technical nightmare because it was newer technology. But for one thing, turbines can only rotate in a single direction. Meaning, the locomotive can only go in a single direction, unless the engineers accounted for this. There were two basic ways. On a direct drive steam turbine locomotive, they had to have a reverse turbine also installed to be used only for going backwards. That was often a pain in the butt because you basically needed a second turbine in addition to the main one. And usually the secondary turbine was much smaller, so the locomotive couldn't go very fast in reverse at all. Other steam turbine designs, which were mostly much later in the steam age, included an electric transmission, which did alleviate that problem significantly. But also, peak efficiency of a turbine can only be achieved if it's exhausting into a near vacuum. This can only be accomplished in this context via a surface condenser. Great, so just install a surface condenser, and that's that's really, that's really, really sweet. Uh, that's an adorable thought. The problem is that surface condensers are really friggin' heavy, thus adding to the overall weight in the locomotive, and they're often more difficult to manage as a direct result because they make the locomotive more complicated. But the biggest issue, more than anything else, with turbines, is that well, remember how I said they had high efficiency at high speed? And that's true. They're great at high speed. They are only efficient at high speed and high power output. And when it comes to running on the railroad, well, frankly, there are just times where you aren't going fast and are not generating a lot of power. In those contexts, all the turbine does is eat fuel, making them tremendously inefficient. Meaning overall, if you look at the numbers, Oftentimes, it was found that the turbines were much worse than conventional steam locomotives, purely because they were idling too much. If you could find a place where they could constantly go at a high rate of speed, yeah, they were great, but there weren't that many places to do that. And sometimes the trains needed to, you know, stop and let people off or unload freight. I mean, you can kind of see the difficulty here. So, overall, 
When it comes to running on the railroad, they basically never worked, but many countries tried to do it, with mixed success. Some were better than others, and at least a couple could be called successful in a very technical sense, but only because of their unique circumstances as well as their design ethos. France made a couple of attempts to make them, with the first being exceedingly similar to the UK's LMS Turbomotive, more on that in a second. That project was cancelled though, and eventually the locomotive was simply built as a compound piston steam engine instead. They made another attempt at it with the SNCF 232.Q.1, which was a bit weird even by turbine locomotives in that the driving wheels weren't connected by side rods at all. Each of the three driving axles had their own turbine. So yeah, this was bizarre. But um, they didn't really get very far with it, mostly because uh, it was 1940. <laughs> And there were some Germans that decided to march <laughs> right up in France's business. The locomotive would be heavily damaged by German troops, in fact, and would be later scrapped after the war was over in 1946. Despite her strange layout, it was known that the tests they were able to conduct showed promise, but the war got in the way. Speaking of Germany, they also made multiple attempts at the concept as early as 1927. A lot of theirs were pretty bizarre, and like most, basically none of them worked or offered any advantages, purely because of the complicated nature and the fact that they were inefficient at low speeds. Italy also took a stab at it, but none of theirs were ever tested on main lines. Switzerland made an attempt at it as early as 1919, and their version was fitted with a cold air blower that fed into the firebox grate rather than a suction fan like many turbines had. That meant that their outing didn't have to deal with the complexity of building a fan that could withstand hot corrosive gases, and that's good. Also, it caused a new problem, a much more alarming one. The firebox was at positive pressure, and if the blower was operating, and the firebox doors were opened, like to feed in fuel, like is normal on steam locomotive operation, uh, that, that would cause the hot gases and cinders to be blown out of them right into the faces of the crew. So that was, that wasn't good. It was so ridiculously dangerous that they decided to replace it with a regular smoke box fan. Uh, the locomotive did not work super well, all things considered, and it was not viewed as a particularly successful design. Even Argentina had one, though this was built by the Swedes in 1925. It was sent to them because they had a route that went through mountainous terrain with few opportunities to take on water. The thought was that a turbine's efficiency would help with this, and it did, technically, but the locomotive wound up with reliability problems, and then would later replace her entirely with a regular piston steam locomotive, but one that was oddly fitted with a condenser. They dodged the turbine thing entirely, but kept the condenser concept, because it did work for their needs. And speaking of Sweden, they do have at least one example of a successful turbine design when it comes to locomotives. This is due to the efforts of Frederick Lundström, an engineer who was very much about trying to make the turbine concept work when it came to locomotives. He first attempted this in 1921, but this attempt was friggin' odd. The driving axles were under the tender, not the engine. So it was the opposite of the way, what, why would you, okay. Not only was this design subject to the usual problems that plagued turbine designs, but also the locomotive's weight wasn't on the drivers, so even if it had been conventional, it still wouldn't have been very good. However, between 1930 and 1936, he did oversee the design of something different, something a bit uh, less ridiculous. These locomotives were similar to a successful freight design and were two eight zeros. And in this instance, Lundström opted to drop the condenser idea entirely because the complexity and pain in the butt it caused, frankly outweighed all the advantages it offered. They were meant to run on a longer line, pulling very heavy coal drags, and in this context they actually flourished all three engines, not being retired until the 1950s and only because the line was electrified. Sweden opted to preserve all three of them, number 71 and 73 are at the Railway Museum of Grangsberg, and number 72 is at the Swedish Railway Museum. Speaking of more successes, we have to talk about the UK, because they made a couple attempts at it too. In their earliest, oddly, offered an electric transmission, built by the North British Locomotive Company back in 1910. 
known as the Reed Ramsey turbine. It had a weird 440 plus 044 wheel arrangement because it had a powered tender. The steam on this one was generated through a standard locomotive boiler with a superheater and then passed to the turbine generator. But the early electric transmission thing just wasn't working, so it would be later rebuilt into a direct drive turbine locomotive. Also, it still didn't work. Uh, <laughs> it still was pretty bad. The Armstrong Whitworth turbine was built in 1922 with a 2662 wheel arrangement and again did have an electric transmission. She was overweight and bad. She was a poor performer and was later scrapped, so that, that also didn't go well. But one of their regular outings did do better, the LMS Turbomotive that I mentioned before. This was built in 1935 as a variation of the Princess Royal class, which were 462 passenger locomotives. She had no condenser at all. They just threw that out entirely. And I think at this point we can kind of agree that maybe just don't have the condenser. It's probably a better idea. The lack of a condenser not only did it avoid overcomplication, but it also meant that the turbine exhaust could still be used through a blast pipe to draw the fire like conventional steam engines did, meaning that they didn't have to have a separate draft fan, which was frankly a pain in the butt. It always caused problems in other designs. The turbomotive didn't have to worry about this at all. She offered greater thermal efficiency than most conventional steam locomotives, and that was partly because she was also given six different steam nozzles. Each could be turned on and off individually. The result was that each nozzle could be allowed to operate, or simply not operate, while at full power, rather than throttling the whole thing down to a lower pressure, which as I've mentioned, is hilariously inefficient on turbines. This meant that the turbomotive turned out okay, but not okay enough that they ever duplicated the design. In fact, after serving for 11 years, it was decided to convert her entirely to a regular piston engine in 1952, renamed Princess Anne. Sadly, after just two months of service in her new form, she would be involved in the very serious Harrow and Wellstone crash, which killed 112 people, injured 340, and resulted in her being scrapped. But what about us in America? Did we ever attempt the turbine thing? And yeah, we did, several different times. How did we handle it? Be honest with this darkness, what did we do? <laughs> you know what we did. We made them as ridiculously large as possible. This is America, where only the largest, beefiest, most ridiculously overpowered locomotives meet the standards. You can't handle the sound of freedom, you fools! Um, America! None of our turbines were very good. Uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> but we tried. General Electric would in fact build two steam turbine electric locomotives with a 4664 wheel arrangement for Union Pacific in 1938. These locomotives, despite being steam turbines, did not look like regular steam turbines. They looked like diesels, but they were steam. They were also the only American outing that actually had a condenser. None of the other ones would. Despite being hailed as the next big thing, neither of the locomotives did particularly well. Union Pacific would send them back, citing issues, and then they'd be sent to the Great Northern Railway, where they actually did fine, but by the end of 1943, both of them needed heavy maintenance, and General Electric opted to simply dismantle them. The other big attempts were all made by Baldwin, who were trying to make steam work against diesels, and since conventional steam engines were on their way out, they thought, well, maybe if we offer steam turbines, we can fix our problems. It didn't work, but they tried. In 1944, they built a single example of a new steam turbine, designated the S2, which is actually one of my favorite steam locomotives ever built, and my favorite steam turbine as a direct result. It looks so cool! She, in fact, would be big chunkus with a 686 wheel arrangement. She was numbered 6200 and offered a maximum power output of 6,900 horsepower. Yes! Yes! Absolutely! Capable of speeds over 100 miles per hour, 
and with her tender, she was 123 feet long. Also, she... Uh... Well, to be fair, she actually worked very well. She pulled trains very smoothly, very efficiently, but again, only at high speed. Pennsylvania Railroad couldn't find too many places where she could operate at full power all the time. So, because of this hindrance, no more S2s were built, and she would be scrapped in May of 1952. Which is sad. <gasps> I wanted to see her. And you took her away from me, you monsters! Speaking of Baldwin, though, they did make two other attempts at the steam turbine thing, and these were a lot weirder. Both of them, again, looked more like diesels than steam engines. The first were constructed between 1947 and 1948, designated the Chesapeake and Ohio class M1s. There were three of them built, and were coal-fired steam turbines, and offered electric transmissions. The S2 didn't, but they turned out to be expensive and being very poor in actual service, to the point that the crew started calling them sacred cows. They were meant for the route between Washington, D.C. and Cincinnati, Ohio, but could never travel the whole route without something breaking. Because they were coal-fired, coal dust and water frequently got into their traction motors. These issues probably could have been fixed, but their inefficiencies at low speeds, because, again, turbines, meant that uh, Chesapeake and Ohio wanted nothing more to do with them, and they were scrapped in 1950. Baldwin made one last stab at this in May of 1954, building the 4,500 horsepower steam turbine electric locomotive Norfolk and Western 2300, nicknamed John Henry. She was a big beast, very similar to the M1s in appearance, but differed mechanically. She offered a lot of modern accommodations, like a Babcock and Wilcox water tube boiler that had automatic controls. That's cool, but there were a couple problems. Uh, for one thing, those automatic controls simply didn't work half the time, so that was great. And she was again coal-fired, meaning that coal dust and water, once again, just like with the M1s, got into the traction motors. She had very similar issues to the M1s, and be retired by 1958. So, I think it's plain to see that there's a reason we don't really see steam turbines that often when it comes to locomotives. Perhaps in some context, in very few circumstances, they did work, but for the most part, they were more trouble than they were worth. It was just the efficiency issue. Like, yes, at high speeds, they are very efficient, but those high speeds can't be maintained, generally speaking, on a railroad setting. At sea, with ships, you can do that a lot. They're great on ships, fantastic, and for power output, since most power stations don't turn off their turbines unless they have to do maintenance. Otherwise, they're just running. And yeah, they're very efficient in that context. But with stop and start railroading, yeah, it's uh, it's not not happening. Not happening, buddy. All of them look cool, though. Gotta give them that. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a bon farewell.